I want to share with you from today now till next week. I'm going to bring it to an end next week, Sunday. What it takes to thrive in chaos. All right. We'll look at the lives of some of these people we've been talking about. What does it take to thrive in chaos? I found out that to thrive in chaos, you must be at peace. To thrive in chaos, the starting point, you must be at peace peace. The word peace also means serenity, the absence of mental stress and anxiety. For you to thrive in chaos, you must be at peace. No matter what the pressure is, no matter the storm raging outside, there must be calmness within you. There must be peace within you. Sometimes what some of us are going through is tough. That it's difficult for you to calm yourself down. You now need to realize that peace is a fruit of the spirit. And so when you get to the point where it's difficult for you to achieve peace by yourself, you need to understand that you have the help of the Holy Spirit to bring about peace from within. Every ship can survive the storm as long as the water does not enter the ship. Do you understand what I'm saying? If the storm does not what? Does not get inside. The Bible said that Jesus was sleeping. There were storms around. The Bible said Jesus was sleeping in the boat. Every other person was afraid. He got up. The Bible said he rebuked the wind. What was the first thing he said? Peace. Be still. But the only reason why he could manifest peace on the outside is, was because he had what? He had peace on the inside. One day Jesus went to preach in church. The church he attended when he was a kid. Amen. And that day he took his text from the book of Isaiah. And said the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Now I want you to picture guys who went to school with him. Guys who were his customers when he was a carpenter. He went away for a few, you know, for a season, and then the guy returned dressed differently with a bit of authority in his voice and said, now nah, I'm the Messiah. Amen. I mean, it's like me on Facebook tomorrow declaring I'm the Messiah. Imagine when this guy now declares himself the Messiah. These guys were angry. The Bible said they took him and they were going to stone him. Amen. They were, you, you. The Bible said they took him to the edge of the cliff to throw him off. The Bible said he turned. And he walked away right in the midst of them all. The reason why you can walk on water is what? It's because you have peace within you. Genesis chapter 1, Bible says what? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Bible says, and the earth was without form and void. Some theologians believe that the better reading of that verse is that the earth became without form and void. Why? Because God is so excellent, whatever he creates is perfect. Is somebody with me? So for the earth to be without form and void, it must have been that something happened. They believe there's something they call the gap theory. They believe that between Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 and Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2 was when Satan fell and he came to the earth, corrupted the earth, and God had to wipe the whole earth with water. That is why water covered the face of the deep. But before anything happened, what did we see? The Bible said the spirit of God was brooding over the face of the water. There was calm, there was peace before God said, let there be light. The reason why you've not been thriving in your own chaos is because you've been speaking out of the storm. You need to speak from peace. You need the partnership of the Holy Spirit to brood over the issue. You need to see what you are facing from the perspective of God. You will stop praying God to deliver you from what he delivered you into. I told you that last week. Bible said Jesus was led of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Some of us were led into our marriages to be... Amen. So now, you know some people so think about their marriage and um, the only thing they remember is still death to us part. Amen. Every time they meditate on their marriage, they do, till death do us part. I say, Lord, I don't know how you're going to do it. But there's nothing too wonderful for you. You give and you take. Blessed be your holy. Till death do us part. Lord, take him away. Some people have got it to a point. The only way out of this, they are so born again, they can't go for a divorce. So God, just take him, amen, in his sleep. Whichever, whichever way you want, let him just sleep, not wake up. Let it not just be my fault. I just want to continue my life without this person. And God is not answering your prayer because the Bible says whatever we ask, if we ask according to his will, how do you tell God to deliver you from what he delivered you into? He didn't answer the prayer of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. That's your cue. God does not answer every prayer. Can we just help somebody here this morning? Right, so you need peace. No, I was talking about God not answering every prayer. Because some people think whatever the issue is, just, just, just God, just God, God. No. Sometimes you need to gain perspective first. Sometimes God may tell you, I, I brought you here to show you something. I brought you here to learn something. I brought you here to be trained. I brought you here to get, listen to this, when God wants to get stuff out of you, he sends people to provoke you. 
When God wants to get rid of your anger, he will get somebody into your life that will get you angry all the time. Praying that the person leaves is not the way forward. Because God wants you to what? To deal with the anger. Hallelujah. Say to your neighbor for me this morning, to thrive in chaos, you have to be at peace. Let's, let's do some bit of Bible study here this morning. John chapter 14 and verse 26. It says, But the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. And verse 27, it says, Peace, I live with you. I'm not sure you get that. In one breath, it said, The Holy Spirit will teach you. The Holy Spirit will reveal things to you. Peace, I live with you. Let's go to the next one. What I want to show you is how that if you are in tune with the Holy Spirit, the after effect is what? Is peace. So I don't need to pursue peace as long as, as much as I pursue communion with the Holy Spirit. It's like water and wet. If you want the wet, you get the water. If you want peace in your heart, okay, you get in step with the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 8 and verse 5 to 6. It says, those who live according to their sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. Those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires the mind of sinful man is death look at the next line but the mind controlled by the spirit is life and peace the mind controlled by the holy spirit is life and peace romans chapter 14 and verse 17 romans chapter 14 and verse 17 it says for the kingdom of god is not a matter of eating and drinking but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. In other words, nothing is wrong with you in the kingdom if eating and drinking is shaky. Because there are so many Christians, that's the next place I'm going to now. There are so many Christians who measure the involvement of God in their lives by material acquisition, by how good life is, by food on the table. And he said to us here, in, kingdom, in the kingdom of God, it's not about eating and drinking. It's not about God solving problems for you and providing you to solutions to your life. It's about righteousness, which is unrestricted access to God. Peace, a tranquil state of the soul that dominates what? Your physical environment. There will be peace around you even though there are storms all over. Why? Because peace is flowing from within you. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So what you need to do is to pursue communion with the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? Acknowledge Him and follow His promptings. The Holy Spirit is such a gentle man that when He suggests something to you and you don't take it, He doesn't force Himself on you. He won't force Himself on you. The Holy Spirit will not lead you beyond your last level of obedience. He has a way of saying the same thing over and over again until you get it. And, so, and listen, He's not in a hurry. There's something I need to tell people, you need to understand this. God is not in a hurry to solve your problems. Get it straight. So the earlier you start learning the lessons, the better. In the kingdom of God, you repeat, there's no carryover. You repeat the class until you pass. Is somebody with me? So your spouse is not going to change until you change. Your money is not going to change until you change. And so the earlier you link with the Holy Spirit, acknowledge him in all your ways, he directs your path and follow his promptings. The earlier you do that, the more you will experience peace. This is what I found out. When you are at peace, you will hear God. It will tell you exactly what to do, exactly where to turn, exactly who to call. Pressure will be taken off your life. Hustle and bustle will be taken off your life. But before it is taken away, you must consciously say to yourself, look, it's not going to happen in a hurry. That's why some people will look at the second coming of Jesus and say, no, it's not going to happen. God is slow. God is not slow. But God is meticulous, detailed. And so you need to just look, Holy Spirit, I give my life to you. I, I've discovered something. If everything is okay with you, you would find out that even though some things are wrong in the world, they are not that bad. How terrible the world is to you is a reflection of the turmoil that is going on within you. There was the story of the man who had bad cheese somewhere on his nose. He was actually lying on the couch and a little boy came playing with him and left stale cheese on his nose. And then the guy woke up and stood in the living room and said, this place stinks. So he left the living room and went to the kitchen. And I was talking to his wife. This place stinks. Then he left, went to his study. This place stinks. Then he went outside the house. The whole world stinks. 
What was thinking? It was right on his own nose. If inside you there is peace, you would notice some of these difficult people are really not as difficult. Some of those people you think are troubling you, they are really not. You know, that was the lesson Anna learned that Penina was not my problem. It was not Penina that made her barren. She was barren because of purpose. And the moment she took her eyes off Penina and went to begin to pray to God, and that's what you need to do. Forget about everybody. Forget what's going on outside and close in with you and God. Elisha told the woman, take what you have inside your house. Lock the door. You and your sons. Your solution is inside. Is somebody with me? Your solution is what is inside. Lock everybody out. You and the Holy Ghost begin to process. It will reveal things to you. It will show things to you. It will lead you. And in that process, it will heal you. How do you know? You will just notice things have not changed on the outside, but you are okay. You are at peace. You are no longer desperate for your husband. And you are no longer checking everybody who says hi to see whether they are your husband or not. It's not like you have said you are not going to get married, but now you are not rushing anymore. So nobody can take you for a ride. Now, when a man comes and says hi, you can read their thoughts. You can't be fooled anymore because you are no longer desperate to get married. Let me say this as I begin to round up today. I will continue next week. Peace also flows from a deep-seated conviction that you have nothing to lose. And I wish that Christians here today would understand something that perhaps all the area boys and the terrorists understand. The reason why would a person come into a congregation of a multitude and tie a bomb to himself and blow himself up? Amen? What pushes a person to that point? They get to the point where there is a higher purpose and they don't see their life as as valuable as that purpose. Listen to me, you will not thrive in chaos. You will not enter some realms of peace until you get to the point where you have nothing to lose. Until you get to the point where you are dead to this world. You're still taking in oxygen. But what it means is the values of the world is no longer your values. The priority of the world is no longer your priority. You have nothing to prove to anybody. And you, what you have, what you don't have does not define your value. What defines you is God's purpose. When you get to that point, there's nothing to lose. You will find out that, listen, when you, from the point of nothing to lose, you begin to experience peace. That's the truth. Most people are desperate because they're trying to prove a point to somebody. You are trying to show people. And that's what puts us under a lot of pressure. Listen, if nobody knows what you are wearing, do you really, are you really bothered that what you wore last week is what you are wearing today? The reason why you are bothered is because you think somebody is looking. So when you become dead, when you stop having a reputation, when you stop trying to protect your reputation, I've taught you this in this church before, to every dream, there is a degree of shame. The Bible said Jesus what? Endured the cross for the joy set before him. What did he do? He despised the shame. I hope you know he was crucified almost naked. The reason why he was, you know some people on the cross, they say, crucify me, but please dress me up. That's the way some of us behave. We are too conscious of what people will say, too conscious of what people are thinking, and that is actually what is putting you in chaos. You can't be at peace. You are married, and you are thinking what your mother-in-law will say. Your mother-in-law that is 65, your mother-in-law, that the only thing she cares about is to see grandchildren before she dies. She has no other purpose to live for. And here you are, 27. She is in the village, you are in Lagos, but she is controlling your life. Because you know the next time she calls, so are you pregnant now? But imagine when you get to the point where you really don't care. It doesn't bother you anymore. Amen? I spoke with one of my role models. And um, he pastored his church for a very long time. It's very popular now. The church is big now. It's rich. It's loaded. You know, I told him, I said, that you are successful now is not the issue. He pastored that church. There were just like maybe 150 people or so for like 10 years. I, I told him, I said, I said, how did you survive? What I want to learn is how you survived that season. It's okay for us to see wisdom in your life now. That you have broken through the challenge with so many of us is not people seeing how you have made it it is making sense to people when you are not even making sense to yourself i said sir how did you do it you know what he told me i didn't care <laughs> i didn't care 
I knew this was what God wanted me to do in my life. I didn't care. Amen. I didn't care. You need to get to that point. No, you are not careless. You just don't care. You are not bothered. You are dead to the world. 